Hey everyone. So I really wasn't satisfied at all with the noise performance I was getting in the last video on the uh, roundness tester when I was taking the uh, measurements uh, with this Brown and Sharp gauge head here. So like I mentioned in the video, I wasn't entirely sure what was going on, but was fairly confident that it was mechanical noise. I've done some more testing and that does appear to be the case. Now there could be a lot of reasons for this, um, but the bottom line and the, the symptom is whatever the setup I've got going on is extremely sensitive to vibration. Uh, disturbances in the, the ground being transmitted from neighbors, the, you know, washing machine. Uh, I'll, I can put pictures up here, but even uh, my fridge compressor running uh, interrupted a measurement at one point. I was taking, I was measuring at one, uh, at very late at night at one point to try and minimize other noise sources and was still seeing a ripple and uh, realized my fridge was running, turned off the breaker, came back, tried it again, the noise was gone. So, I mean, it's, it's a problem. This is, a, this is not a, like, not a sustainable uh, setup. I need something more rigid. Now, part of the fact is, is the fact that I'm on this, you know, cheap wooden workbench here. I don't have any sort of vibration isolation underneath the surface plate, apart from the rubber feet uh, that it comes on. And so I might look into um, putting something underneath this uh, to help isolate it a little bit better. And I've got an idea for that, or someone gave me an idea for that. We may get into that later. But first I wanted to start with the indicator stand. I have suspicions about this indicator stand. It's very nice. Uh, it's flexure based. Uh, you've got this fine adjust knob here and you have a nice linear translation up and down for the adjust. Very, very nice mechanism. But there's something inside of it when I hit it that I heard and I have a suspicion for how it's working on the inside. So we're gonna take a look and I, I think I, I think we can address the problem here. I think the problem lies within the indicator stand. That's my hypothesis. So let's get into it and see if we can address the issue. Okay, so I've just had this thing open. Uh, it's basically held together by these two countersunk screws there. When you take those out, the main dovetail rail comes off. Uh, this is, of course, what the whole clamping mechanism rides on. Um, you've got this pin screwed into the bottom, which is where the rocker bar for the fine adjust on the base pushes on to actually the stand up and down. First thing I noticed, this is completely loose. I'll tighten that. Can't, can't hurt anything. Uh, next, behind it, there's this sheet metal cover, which you'll see what that's for in a moment. And then behind that, you've got the, the sort of heart of the mechanism here two four bar leaf flexure stages. You can see them wiggle back and forth there. And so the screw bolts the dovetail rail to the stages clamping this sheet metal piece uh, in between. And that's how you get your, your fine adjust motion in a vertical, vertical direction. Now where I think the problems are coming from is the method that is used to sort of preload this whole stage uh, against the rocker bar down here. You could just use the inherent uh, restoring force from the stiffness of the flexure stages, but these aren't, you know, super stiff. You want a little bit more, I guess. And this is what I found inside that they used. Very uh, surprisingly stiff uh, spring here. And I think this is where uh, our noise uh, excitation, whatever you want to call it, uh, is coming from. So let me show you why I think that. So I've got the sheet metal piece uh, stood back up on there uh, and it's the spring is now in place so that's how it's being held on here. Um, you can see there's a little cutout that one hook of the spring goes in on the sheet metal part and then if I sort of peel this back ooh, it's quite quite stiff quite quite highly preloaded. You can see how it hooks into the, the frame of the, uh, the indicator base there. 
And you probably could tell from when it just uh, snapped there a little bit. But I can demonstrate it here. This rings like, I don't know if you, like a, like a garage door spring. I mean, this is like, this is really, even after the audible noise goes away, I can feel this thing still shaking in my hands um, really, really badly. So you've got basically a nice, tightly, tightly preloaded resonating band inside of your indicator, uh, indicator stand that an external impulse stimulus can excite and then just allow this whole thing to, to shake. So that's probably, uh, that's my hypothesis for the main issue with this stand. Um, obviously this thin sheet metal uh, piece is not helping anything either. That also rings like a bell. And unfortunately, I did find out as well, I didn't mention this in the last video, but I was having lots of problems with drift on the indicator. Like I would tighten up the stand, get everything set and dialed in, and that, that indicator would just you know move for way longer than uh, I would have thought it should. And it turns out that was thermal. It's because this is aluminum, this column here. This is actually in a piece of aluminum extrusion that's been cut. They had these windows cut out of it to allow the uh, flexure stages to be bolted on here. So when I, I guess when I was tightening it, right, I'd have my hand on it and be positioning things and snugging it down and then that warmed it up and then it would cool down or uh, equilibrate as after I had it set and it was just sitting there. It also uh, explains why I would see the indicator move, moving the most when the heating came on in uh, my apartment here. So. Let's see how we can uh, potentially address some of these issues. Okay, so the solution route I'm going with here is basically just to add damping. Uh, the first way I'm planning on doing this is by uh, adding a little heat shrink uh, around the uh, spring itself. So this is obviously unstretched right now. When it's assembled, uh, it's under a pretty strong preload, so it'll be you know something more like that. And the plan is to mostly reassemble it, get this uh, spring stretched out, uh, and then shrink the uh, heat shrink down, um, just to act as a sort of snug elastomeric uh, sleeve to go around the spring to, you know, add some damping. Uh, to take this even a step further, uh, what I'm gonna do is, when this is assembled, the spring sits in here a little bit off to the side like this. Um, but what I've done is I've cut a couple pieces of foam and they'll come in here and basically cradle it uh, as it sits inside the channel. And this will obviously add some amount of damping for the spring, but I'm hoping it will also help the sheet metal as well. Um, ring a little bit less. Although I don't think the sheet metal was the problem. I really do think the spring was the source of, of most of the issues I was seeing there. So this is the idea. I'm gonna try this out and hopefully we can uh, see if, uh, see some improvements uh, on, the, on the noise floor. So here's the uh, tubing shrunk in place there. I don't know if you can hear, but certainly knocked off most of those high frequencies I was hearing. Um, and hopefully that big, those big foam chunks will help with the uh, low frequency stuff. So here it is with the compressor running. Already much better. And now the compressor stopped. It's certainly improved. When I tap my foot, you can still see a disturbance. You know, as scientific as I can be, I'm trying to tap it at the, at the same amount that I did in the previous video. And it's uh, at least decaying a lot faster. The damping is clearly improved there. As far as the steady state noise floor, there certainly seems to be less of it. My fridge compressor is on right now, so maybe we can blame part of it on that. 
Here, let me uh, zoom in the scale here, actually. Okay, so now we're plus or minus 10 millionths of an inch. So this whole band here is a half a micron wide for scale. So, you know, that's pretty, pretty zoomed in. And our ripple is, well, that's a lot less than it was before. This is me just moving my feet around back and forth, again, the taps. And, you know, there is disturbance because there's going to be some. And, again, I have no good isolation under this right now. But that is improved. So let's see if we can't push this a little further still. And just to interject here, I'm, sh I'm sure I'll maybe still get some comments about it possibly being electrical noise at this point, just to sort of demonstrate that there is still a mechanical <clears throat> noise floor here. I can turn the input to my amplifier off. So right now it's, you know, on when I poke the gauge, it's, it's responding. But if I set it to zero, we're not, we're no longer reading from channel B or channel A, uh, and it defaults to, to zero, of course. And so now the analog output is really just, you know, anything we're seeing here is not mechanical. This is just the electrical noise floor of the instrument. And that's certainly smaller than, uh, than what we're seeing normally. So just to show, this is our true limit. Can't really expect to get any better than this uh, unless we start poking around uh, with, the, with the electronics, which I don't really plan to, but this is what we're aiming for. How's this for ridiculous? As awful as it looks, it might might be uh, might be worth something here. Thanks to a uh, Daniel for this idea. Really, really clever. I, you know, I had one of these lying around in my uh, closet. Luckily, he suggested an inner tube, and I thought, you know, that's a great, you know, relatively strong but uh, compliant with adjustable stiffness. Uh, isolator I can maybe put together. So we'll try this out. Let's see let's see how it does. So here's the surface plate on the the inner tube pneumatic isolation table. And here's the results. Looking pretty good. Keep in mind the uh, fridge compressor is still running. Um, but I mean, this is getting pretty close to those those electrical noise levels, and I guess most importantly, here's that same foot tap from before. You can still see it. It's not gone completely, but certainly diminished in amplitude greatly. So, quite pleased with this. And if you're wondering why I'm really splitting hairs to this level and trying to push the noise floor, you know, below one micro inch. This is why. For roundness testing, yeah, it's probably, you know, what you saw in the original video probably is fine for most stuff. But here we're set up measuring the axial error motion of the spindle itself. We've got the indicator right at the center, indicating on the optical flat. Doesn't technically even need to be an optical flat, it's just a nice smooth surface. Uh, but let's take a look at the measurement here. So this is the plot of the axial air motion. And this is a peak to valley air motion of 0.64 micro inches. I'll put the uh, nanometers on screen for you metric folk. I'll convert for you this one time just so you can see how impressive this is. But that is a crazy small amount of air motion for a spindle. And you can see in the raw data here, sort of the magnitude of what we're dealing with and why why having five micro inches of noise every time you know your neighbor opens a door is not acceptable. So this is a performance I'm uh, starting to be happy with and we'll, we'll call it there. Obviously it doesn't always need to be performing at this level. This is only for the highest uh, precision measurements. So realistically, I'll probably be taking this out uh, just because this isn't, as you can see, not the most stable thing in the world and only using it when I really need 
that extra bit of performance, but that did certainly improve things. So yeah, this is, I guess a sneak peek for the next precision spindle metrology video where we'll be actually measuring some air motion. But here, here's some uh, spindle air motion for you. 0.64 micro inches of axial air motion. How cool is that? Hope you guys enjoyed and I'll see you next time.